Well, with more on these stories, let's bring in our political strategist. Greg McEckern is an Ottawa-based consultant and former Liberal strategist. Kate Harrison is the Vice Chair of Summa Strategies. And Kim Wright is the Principal with Wright Strategies. Hello to the three of you. Hello. Listen, I want to begin here with the uh, Public Service Alliance strike, obviously now dragging out into a second week. And there are a few issues holding up negotiations, among them salaries, perhaps not, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, the union does say uh, that they dropped their demands from the last one we heard, so down from the 13.5% uh, over three years. But the government seems to be holding very fast to its 9% offer. Uh, Greg, why is the, the government playing hardball here? I'm not sure it's as much hardball as just basic negotiations, but there is the reality um, that we have to pay for um, the pandemic. And I'm sure that the government is keeping an eye on everything that they have to, they've committed to, whether it's you know the healthcare deals with the provinces or this. Um, there's also a, a bit of a feeling that this is an, an air war. Um, the president of the Treasury Board, Mona Forche, has started communicating through open letters. So kind of going over the heads of the union directly to the public and to union members. And, and what's interesting is I noticed last weekend that the, the rhetoric really changed. It got like a lot tougher from the union, very personal when it came to Forche. And perhaps it's a coincidence, but that came right after some media reports that the number of union members that actually voted was pretty low uh, by Canadian standards. So um, it, it does feel like there's an air war going on. And you know, from what I saw today at the press conference, it felt like the union leadership was still talking to their membership. So you know, as someone based in Ottawa, when I listen to local radio, I you know, read local news, um, you know, you're hearing from union members who are still a bit uncomfortable that they're on strike and then they know that the, the public hasn't yet kind of joined um, their cause. I think people can understand some of the wages seem pretty low when you, you know, in an expensive city like, like Ottawa, for example. But in terms of the work from home, a lot of people in the private sector were given those instructions back in November. So, I, you know, I still feel like the federal government, you know, understands that, you know, the public might not be completely on side with the union and they have that as part of their um, you know, negotiating tools. Mm -hmm. Now, now, PSAC, and I'll bring you, uh, Kate, into this, uh, they do argue that when when they talk about a salary increase, increase, they just really don't want to fall behind the cost of living. And, and they point to the fact that CEOs did get bonuses through the pandemic, government's uh, bottom lines across the country increased thanks to uh, inflation. What do you make of the union demand? As I said, they, they just want to keep up with the cost of living. Yeah, I, I understand that to a point. I think that that's why there there is rightly the argument for some correction. Uh, but we don't often see the reverse argument, of course, which is when inflation is low, uh, salaries decrease. So there needs to be a little bit of, of understanding that we are in an exceptional time. Inflation has um, it perhaps leveled off for a period of time um, that we still see PSAC negotiating for uh, an exorbitantly high rate. I think Greg made a really important point, which is that uh, from the outside, these are good paying jobs. There was quite a bit of flexibility during the pandemic uh, to work from home. We didn't see uh, paychecks clawed back as a result of the nature of work shifting or when government services were inaccessible. Uh, these people still got paid and that that's all well and, and good. But when you're on the outside now looking at the complaints being leveled from PSAC, I just don't think it lines up with where the public sentiment is at right now. Things might change if service delivery starts being massively disrupted, if we see disruption um, at borders, for instance, or when people are traveling, uh, the delays in passports, et cetera. That's when the government will start feeling more pain. Mm -hmm. Kim, I, I, Kim, I want to bring you in, but you know, people, uh, we, we've heard both, both Greg and Kate reference public sentiment, but there was this uh, poll that came out today uh, from Angus Reid, and it says Canadians are actually supportive of many union demands, with 55% of Canadians agreeing that federal employees uh, do have a right to work from home. Uh, what do you make uh, of the negotiations so far? Yeah, they, they switched, the government switched over to air war because they took a playbook out of Doug Ford and said, look, let's just talk about wages and make them vilified of being these high paid workers, as opposed to uh, the range of workers, the people who help fill out your passports and they do the government services. It's really also an interesting pivot because you also saw the government of Canada somehow being able to come up with $13 billion for a private company called Volkswagen to come in and, and invest in a town, which frankly, 
likely there's a lot of electric vehicle charging infrastructure companies uh, in Canada that would have liked those kind of resources, let alone the public service uh, who could then get those raises that they've been asking for because there would have been that money in there. But the pro- the prim- sorry, the prime minister uh, chose to you know take a playbook out of you know corporate welfare bums and give that kind of money out. It wasn't necessary, but now they're trying to pivot away and call call PSAC members well good public servants a bit lazy and maybe they should come out of their out of their homes and come back to work the reality is we all need to every business that's listening and that is watching this is saying okay we need to rethink how we do some work from home how do we do job shadowing how do we do job training and the government becomes a bit of a test case for that but the reality is there's lots of money within the federal government there are lots of programs they could allocate to making sure that uh, that these workers are taken care of. They've chosen to go into a public battle because they think that's the way to get people to to cave on this. And the reality is that you just need to treat your workers fairly. And as always, a negotiated settlement is always the best settlement, not only in the workplace, but for taxpayers as well. Okay, okay, so we'll, we'll keep watching negotiations. But you know, I'm quickly running out of time. I do want to ask about Sudan before, before we're done today. Uh, as you know, at this point, the government has evacuated dozens of Canadian nationals from Sudan. Hundreds more are calling for help. Uh, a minute to each of you here. What more, if anything, can the government do to address the situation? Uh, Greg? I, I think continuing to do what they're doing right now, which is working with our partners, trying to find angles in, collaborating with other countries. You know, I, I did a quick check, Michael. Um, you know, The Economist in early January mentioned that there was some economic strife in Sudan. But this, I think, took a lot of people by surprise but in mid-April. So I think, you know, Canada, for the country the size we are, I think we're doing uh, our level best. Uh, Kate, what would you say to the matter? Yeah, there's a certain level of readiness that Canada just has been not able to to achieve on matters like this for, for years now. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the situation we saw in Afghanistan and the, the disorganization that occurred there. I mean, we have to continue to make sure we've got a good relationship with allies because they continue to be the ones to to bail us out of these really uncomfortable circumstances. Germany and others stepped up and have been putting a number of Canadians on, on their aircraft. But it does draw attention, Michael, to the need to uh, better resource, um, you know, rescue military defense efforts. Uh, and that is a slow moving process. Kim? Absolutely. What we remember from those images out of Kandahar were uh, children being separated from their parents, people having to go to internet cafes that had, ma- you know, the, the paperwork that had maple leaves on them to try to fill up paperwork. And surprise, surprise, the Taliban got a little grumpy about that. How would do we not have a readiness model? What is our intelligence community uh, not doing to flag this? Or does the minister just sit on these reports like they have so many others? And at the end of the day, Canada has this great reputation uh, as a, in their humanitarian efforts, but when push comes to shove, somehow we always seem to step in the paperwork. And that has to change because there is going to be more Sudans, there are going to be more Kandahars, there are more problems in the global community that Canada just seems to be ill-prepared to deal with. Okay, well, always get, uh, good to get your thoughts on the matter. Uh, Greg, Kate, and Kim, thank you for the time. And I swear, before the season's through, I'm just going to have a whole half hour with the three of you because there is never enough time. Uh, but thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.